And by the way, those of you that came straight into the um, audience here, we've got some of the people that will be uh, giving talks. We'll have them up, uh, some of the others up during breaks. You're going to get to meet people that you've heard me talk about for a long time. A lot of them are down the hall in a room there, and you can meet uh, a lot of these people that can uh, help you with everything from soil testing to nutritional products. Here's what we want to accomplish. We want to accomplish uh, a root system on plants that looks like this. And it surprises people often when they see this shot when I tell them that that's not really the root system that they're looking at. What they're looking at uh, there, what we're all looking at there is mycorrhizal fungus. The only part of that shot that is roots are up there at, right at the base of this little pine tree seedling where you see those nodules and you see the brown root structure. The rest of that is mycorrhizal fungus. If you go organic, if you use nothing but compost and mulch, you'll develop this on your roots, on the root system of your plants. But on the other hand, uh, there are things that we can do to speed up the process. Here's what we want to accomplish. We want to have the chemistry, the physics, and the biology in a healthy condition in the soil. The people that push the synthetic fertilizers and the pesticides think about one thing. They think about the chemistry. Well, chemistry is important. The MPK, the trace mineral availability, all that is very important, but we need to have the biology and the physics in place as well. Biology is the earthworms, the microorganisms, bacteria, and the mycorrhizal fungi, the protozoa, all those uh, microscopic things that should be in the soil. But we also need the physics good, the aeration, the drainage of the soil. Uh, the, the physical properties, in other words. And anything you do to any of those three to make them more balanced will help the other two. But the easiest way to go is to do things that help the biology. And then everything else moves along for the ride. This program is very simple. It's compost, rock powder, and sugar. That's the organic program. It's that simple. Nothing else um, really matters, and when you hear people talk about using synthetic fertilizers, you'll hear them talk about NPK and the chemistry. You'll never hear much, uh, if anything, about the physical properties or the, um, or the biology, other than maybe tilling some of their uh, peat moss and chemicals into the soil. And by the way, I don't recommend peat moss. I recommend compost. And I recommend healthy compost. If you make compost at home, which I recommend that you do, it'll look something like this. You'll actually be able to see and feel and smell the life in the compost. You can actually see the, the filaments of mycorrhizal fungus in a healthy uh, compost. It can, you can buy compost if you don't want to make it yourself. But it is uh, one of, not the, but one of the most important pieces of the puzzle. Here's what I recommend you do with the peat moss you might still have at home. If you grow potatoes or if you save your bulbs, your flowers, uh, from year to year, it's the best medium in the world to store things in. And that also points out why I don't like it. It doesn't promote bacterial growth. It's basically sterile. So things will stay in it over the winter or whatever, and then like uh, you see here with our uh, sweet potatoes, they're in perfect shape once you uh, take them out of the dry peat moss. I don't recommend it in the soil because it's antimicrobial, it's too expensive, and doesn't work nearly as well as our locally and regionally made composts and mulches. The rock powders are just as important as the compost. This is where a lot of people stump their toe a little bit because you've got to understand this. You need to use lava sand, zeolite, green sand. Green sand is not really a rock, it's a marine deposit, but I put it in the rock category. You can use granite, different kinds of, uh, of granites, schist, any kind of rock material that's different, a different color, a different texture than the base rock on your property will help things grow. So it's composting mulches the organic piece, then the rock, ground up rock materials, just as important. And then the third piece is important, especially in the front end of a, of a project. When you're doing new uh, vegetable beds, new landscaping or new herb gardens, and that sugar. This is uh, the sugar that I recommend the most on the left here. That's dry molasses. 
And we use it just like a fertilizer application at about 20 pounds per thousand square feet. I'm sorry, the lava sand's on the left, the dry molasses is on the, uh, on the right. What it is is little bits of organic matter like soy or something like that that have been sprayed with molasses. So you get the combination of carbon and um, uh, protein in the same material and that's why it functions so well as, a, as an organic fertilizer. Another sugar that I recommend a lot is corn and I, I call it a sugar because it converts to sugar so efficiently. That's why you shouldn't eat very much of it. Corn is nutritious, um, genetically modified a lot of it, unfortunately, but it, uh, if you eat a lot of it, you're going to be putting on some pounds because it does convert to sugar so efficiently, so effectively. That's why it works so well in the soil. It functions as a sugar to stimulate biological activity. We first started using it as a disease control. Uh, because we found that when it is put in the soil, it stimulates a beneficial organism called trichoderma. And when trichoderma grows, it controls a lot of the disease pathogens like rhizoctonia and several other diseases. It can be used uh, in potting soils if you don't use too much of it. It can be used uh, as a broadcast application across your seedlings or uh, mixed into beds anytime you plant something new, which I recommend. Here again is what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop roots like on the uh, right there instead of on the left. That was an actual research project in uh, Texas, and uh, I'll think of the name of the town in a minute. I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, Gonzales. It was Gonzales Greenhouse down in uh, Gonzales, Texas. And the experiment was to fertilize with a commercial a uh, miracle grow type product on the left and on the right an organic fertilizer was used. That was the only difference. And you can see the big difference in the roots of the plants. That grower experienced less disease problems, less insect problems on the ground cover crops, and fewer deaths of his young plants and thus better production and better profits. Again, this is what we want. The tomato plant on the right has been uh, treated with something the one on the left hasn't been treated with, and that's mycorrhizal fungus or mycorrhizae. And that's the only difference in those two. The, the production increase can be tremendous if you just simply do things that encourage mycorrhizal fungus. And guess what does? Everything that I've talked about so far, the rock materials, the sugar, the, the organic materials, stimulate the beneficial bacteria and the fungus. And it works on all crops. It works on vegetables, herbs, trees very effectively, and it also works on grasses. Those uh, two plantings there are both bent grass. One on the left has been, the seed were treated with mycorrhizae, and on the right they weren't. Um, then the uh, maintenance program is as simple as the installation program. We recommend putting out one dry fertilizer a year at least. Some people will put as many as three, spring, early summer, and fall. Some people, especially people who have been organic for a while, will do one application a year. Some like to do it in the fall, some like to do it in the spring. Uh, there's a little bit of a debate there. And then the rest of the year we like to put out this mixture that we call garret juice either on a monthly basis or at least a quarterly basis. Some people's budget only allow it to be done one time. And Garrett juice, as probably a lot of you know already, is compost tea or liquid humate and molasses, vinegar, seaweed, and um, the uh, fish for the uh, Garrett juice plus, which we uh, have found makes it work even better. The formula is for you on the website and in my books or you can get the commercial uh, pro uh, products as well. And we recommend that program, a simple uh, fertilizer application and then liquid Garrett juice mixture from, for everything from ranches and farms to polo fields to orchards to landscaping, to herbs and vegetable gardens, and we've done it from Maine to Florida to California to Washington and Oregon, and even blueberries in Kansas. All kinds of crops and all kinds of soils and all kinds of weather 
that simple program works. Compost, rock powders, sugars, natural mulches, of course, and uh, then the uh, dry fertilizer, one to three applications a season, and then the spraying of uh, garret juice plus as often as the budget and your time allows. Now you can speed up the process of mycorrhizal fungus by using something like this product which uh, contains beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizal fungus and you can meet the owner of this uh, product line here. They are uh, down in the room down the hall and uh, during the breaks you can uh, talk to all these uh, people that you're going to be uh, hearing me talk about and hearing from. One of the research projects that's important for you to, to understand about how much better organics works than the typical chemical approaches from this simple test that Dr. Michael Amaranthus did up in um, Oregon. A friend of mine, also the uh, co-author with me and uh, John Ferguson on our professional book, the newest book we did. But what, ha what they did here was fertilize the corn on the right with the typical synthetic fertilizer that's recommended in, in the industry, in the agriculture industry. On the left, organic fertilizer, and uh, the seed were treated with mycorrhizal fungus. That was the difference in the two. You can see the plant production, the size and the colors better, but here's the most important part of the story. The water that went through, they put the same amount of water on both of these test uh, plantings. The water that came through the synthetic side is represented on the right over there. You can see the volume of of water there. And on the left is the water that came through on the organic test uh, planting. Now, there's two things there. One is the nutrients that leached through, and then, but maybe even bigger, and it gets to be a bigger deal every year, is the volume of irrigation and or rain that's needed for the two programs. So in the organic program, far less water is wasted, more water is kept in the, uh, the root system, and uh, the nutrients uh, as well. Pretty big deal. Just another part of the organic piece of the puzzle is the mulch. The shredded mulch is what we recommend. Shredded native tree trimmings. You can use cedar, you can use hackberry, you can use whatever's growing on your property. And it holds in place, it looks good, it breaks down rather quickly, which is important. We want that. We don't want something like cypress that hangs around too long. Uh, we don't want to use pine bark because of that issue. It won't stay in place. It washes away, it blows away. It, if it does stay in place, it breaks down into some pretty nasty natural chemicals that really aren't very good for early uh, plant growth. So it's, it's the most used mulch, and it's the one that I like the least. I like pine straw, though, it might surprise you, because it doesn't have the same chemical properties. It stays in place better, and it breaks down and, and feeds plants a lot better the pine needles, but the pine bark, not a good choice. Tony Manasseri is one of the uh, experts that you'll hear from today, uh, moderator on our forums, and um, he and his wife have a farm in McKinney, and this is a shot he gave me that I love because it shows shredded tree trimmings, I think that he got from a, somebody clearing an area, piled up uh, the material. The pile that you see in the back is after it had been sitting around a couple of years. You don't even have to maintain shredded tree trimmings for it to finally break down and become beautiful compost. Uh, we can put it on the soil as a mulch and it'll do it there. It's called sheet composting, or you can pile it in a pile and let it, uh, let it break down. If you turn it occasionally, it'll go faster, but you don't have to do that. You're going to hear a lot about trees. Tyson Woods is going to be doing demonstrations for you here about tree flares and all. We want our trees to look like that. Doesn't matter whether it's a Japanese uh, maple or a fruit tree or an oak or anything in between. The flares of trees uh, should be uh, exposed so much so that you can step on the flare. A lot of people think that it ought to be just curving out just a little bit. That's not right. It needs to be uh, very much exposed. This is, Tyson and I were talking about it earlier, this is one of the most common things that we see, not only here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but around the country, uh, plant uh, trees that are coming out of the ground just like a telephone pole. 
or like a pencil stuck in the ground. When you have that, you know that your tree is way too deep in the ground. We don't like the little beds built around trees either because that tends to create a situation where they get to be too uh, deep in the soil. Here you see the soil being taken off in that situation, more than uh, 10 inches of soil uh, removed to get down to the flare. You see two things. You see the soil up on the trunk, but you also see the roots coming up and in a lot of the cases circling around and girdling uh, the tree. So it's bad just in, in, in all ways. And Tyson will t go into this in some more detail for you. But this is a plant that I have to admit to you that I pulled out of my own landscaping at home. It was a, a native plant, a Carolina buckthorn, that we transplanted years ago. You know, a whole bunch of people working on the site, and I wasn't paying attention, and it got planted. You see the crown well, way down here. Let me see if I can figure out how to use this laser here. There you go. The Somebody else has got the laser. <laughs> okay. uh, let me go. Tyson, the, the planting area, the line is way up there is where it was planted, right up there where he's showing. The crown of the plant is way down here was over a foot deep. And you can see what happened. It tried to grow back up to the surface, but it actually rotted in the ground and I lost that plant. I hate to admit to you, but I've had some, uh, most of my trees at my own property too deep in the ground. Not as deep as that one. I got a call on the air one day from Terry in um, Waco, and he said, Howard, my bur oak tree is starting to thin out in the top just a little bit, and there's a little bit of dead. You think it could be too deep in the ground? And I said, well, Terry, is it coming out of the ground straight? And he said, absolutely. I've been listening to you, and it's coming out of the ground just like a telephone pole. Uh, he, I said, well, it's too deep in the ground. He said, can I uncover it myself? And I said, yeah, if you're careful, you can do it a little bit at a time and uh, with brushes and hand tools and uncover it. Well, he did, and he called me back in a couple of weeks on the air again. He said, Howard, this is Terry again. At what depth should I find the flare? He uncovered on, on this uh, bur oak eight feet on one side and ten feet on the other. He's an engineer, and he measured the uh, circumference and the diameter of the trunk when he did the work, and he's been monitoring it now over the years, and it has responded. It's growing very well. It has filled back out on top. So it doesn't matter how old your plant is. It can be a young uh, shrub or, or vine that you plant, too, that's too deep in the container and has this circling and girdling roots. If you have that, what you need to do, and, you, and you'll have it almost in every case, throw it over in a bucket of water. We do this with all the plants that we plant, all the uh, shrubs, all the trees. We even do it with perennials and annuals to, uh, to an extent. You, you soak the plant in water, get it thoroughly hydrated, then you can take those circling and girdling roots that are way too high off. You can pull the roots apart a little bit. We used to recommend cutting and scraping the uh, root balls that were too uh, bound, that were root bound, but we like this technique now a whole lot better. That's an oak, that's a cambio oak that we completely bare rooted two uh, winters ago and planted, and it's doing very, very well at our experimental uh, office. But I, I tend to recommend to people now to kind of semi-bare root the plant. Put it in water, let it soak, let the, the soil fall off the outside so you can see the roots. Uh, uncover the ones that are up too high. Get all the burlap off of uh, bald and burlap uh, trees. In other words, get it pretty close to being uh, totally bare rooted and planted, especially if you do it in the winter. If you apply a, a mycorrhizal fungus product to the roots, uh, at planting time, like this plant success, it's a gel. You mix it in water and it makes a pretty uh, a thick material. You can dip the plants in it or you can spray the roots with this material. And some of the first plants that we bare rooted, that's that little canby oak uh, that was bare rooted. But some of the first plants that we did the total bare rooting to, we treated with this uh, mycorrhizal fungus gel and it really made a big difference. When your plant is completely planted it should look like this. It shouldn't be thinned out very much at all. It should not have any wrapping on the trunk. That's the one of the silliest things that can be done. It's not only unnecessary but it's detrimental to the plant. 
in a lot of different ways, and you should try to avoid staking the tree. In most cases, commercial projects where I've been involved as the landscape architect or a consultant, we've, uh, we've put into the specifications that you cannot stake the tree unless it leans heavy winds or it has some unusual situation, and then you just do it on the trees that need it on an ad alternate price per tree. You don't put it into the specifications to do all of the trees. And then the same thing at home. Don't stake unless you have to, and then you leave it on there as short a period of time as possible. Just real quickly, some projects that some of you may not have seen that are organic. This is the one in Houston, uh, Texas, that proved it was the first project to actually document that with an organic program, we can cut the water use on the project by 50%. This is Bio Ben. It's I'm a Hog's old estate. It's part of the uh, Houston Museum system now. You can see it's an extremely formal garden. And the, the curator didn't want to go organic. He fought the idea with the people that own it, which are the ladies of the River Oaks Garden Club, and, and they asked me if it could be done organic. I said, sure, we do much larger projects organic than Bio Ben. They, they made him do it, and he was so opposed to it, he was very careful to keep all the records of what he spent on fertilizer and pesticides and water, and he now is one of the biggest fans that we have because he saw uh, very clearly that 50% uh, was reduced in, in water use. And if you can do it on a formal garden like that, you can do it anywhere. This is another good example. This is the Texas Discovery Gardens uh, in Dallas, and it's been maintained organically now for about eight years, and it has a teeny tiny budget. They hardly have enough, you wouldn't believe how small it is to cover the salaries, the products that they use, and the, and the whole thing, and it has to be self-sustaining like a a lot of the city projects are becoming. And it not only looks beautiful, as you can see there, a lot of you probably have been there. If you haven't, you, you need to go uh, see it. Uh, it. It has been certified organic through our nonprofit organization, the uh, uh, Texas Organic Research Center, and it looks very, very good. We've worked on a couple of golf courses. This is in Arlington called Tierra Verde, and it is um, using a total fertility program that's organic. They still use a few herbicides, haven't gotten away from them 100%, but they're doing a good job at getting very, very close to total organic program, and they have cut their water bill by 40%. Well, on a golf course, the, the irrigation uh, part of the budget, it, that's the largest uh, piece of the budget, the largest line item in the budget. And we've seen it down at, uh, at Texas Tech. The um, Rawls golf course out there was maintained organically uh, until the new management company came in and they had their own in-house superintendents and I haven't had any contact with them since. But when, when uh, the young fellow that I knew was there, he was doing an organic program. He was basically fertilizing with a commercial, his version of Garrett juice that he made himself and he was injecting it into the irrigation and uh, watering the whole place uh, with fertigation, and the turf was beautiful, and water savings was great. Those superintendents have proven, by the way, how much more efficient organic fertilizer is getting into the plant than the synthetic fertilizer, about 60% more efficient at a minimum. Synthetic fertilizers volatize into the air. They're part of air pollution. They wash away on the surface and they leach through the soil. The organic uh, fertilizers stay in place and are uh, turned into uh, useful material when needed. It can be done on any kind of soil anywhere in the United States. Once again, sand, clay, any color. That's the soil I deal with in Lakewood, Texas. Solid rock. We have about six inches of black clay on top of some soft caliche, and then under that, that's a, a leak and a water line out in the street in front of my house. So it doesn't matter how bad the soil is, and that's, that's the front yard, just you know, 15 feet from where you uh, saw that hole. So it works. 
anywhere. Uh, the book that's the new one is this one, The Organic Management for the Professional. By the way, all during the day we're going to have some giveaways. Logan's going to be uh, helping with that, some prizes for you. Some of my books are a part of the prizes. But also the wonderful line of steel products, if you haven't checked them out out there, you need to. They're run uh, with the lithium uh, batteries. They're giving away your choice, whoever wins that prize. And you'll get to see the chainsaw and the mower and all that stuff out there. Just incredible. Um, real quick thing on my health program. I get a lot of questions about my, what I do nutritionally in my health and vitamin program. And the, most, the two most important parts, I think, are this, these two. Every morning, I rinse my mouth out with uh, baking soda. I usually do it at, at night as well. I think it's one reason I never have colds and I've never had the flu. Those two things right there. Uh, also drink apple cider vinegar in the morning when I use and I do the regular vitamins, you know, D and folic acid and K and, you know, all the regular kinds of things. The probiotics, Dr. O'Hara's probiotics too. But these two things I think need to be in all of your, uh, your programs. This is something I'd recommend you make a note of. You can go online to the uh, Vinegar Institute and they'll send you a copy of that for free. It covers all of the different uses of vinegar and it's a wonderful little uh, pamphlet that they, they have there. You can go to dirtdoctor.com and go into the vinegar part of the library and you can see some of that information. Two books I recommend highly, Wheat Belly, uh, which is a very controversial book right now, the uh, state the states of Washington and Oregon, the, we get a paper called Capital Press, and it's a wonderful paper. It covers agriculture up there in the Pacific uh, Northwest, and they've got some organic information in the paper, and they've got some regular stuff, but they're fighting this book right now because a lot of them grow and sell wheat, and it's a big part of their, uh, uh, you know, their income. But this book is all about all the things that wheat does th that's bad for you. Uh, fermentation, I recommend you, all of you either buy fermented, really good uh, quality fermented food. Um, you're going to hear from uh, Robert Hutchins today who is involved with uh, grass-fed stuff and also uh, food that they sell down at the Dallas Farmers Market that are fermented, sauerkraut and pickles and relishes and things like that. That book is about how you can do it uh, yourself. Um, well, let's see if I can go back a second here. Uh, both books I recommend. I don't know that they're being sold here today, I don't think, but you can buy them online and uh, recommend putting them in your, into your program. Everybody in the room and everybody listening across the country should be taking this probiotics. I think it's the very best in the world. Uh, Andy's got a whole store set up down in the room down there where you can buy that and a whole lot of these other things that I talk about, including the portable sauna. Judy and I are very big fans. Logan's tried it a few times too. It's a sauna that you sit in and you get infrared and sweat and uh, it's really, Judy's kind of hard to talk into some of these things, but she has become a big fan of how it helps with aches and pains, backache, uh, helps with weight loss, helps with general, uh, general uh, good health. The crazy water people are here. My favorite water by far, uh, full of trace minerals. You can talk to those people and meet them. And um, I'll be around to talk again this afternoon. The, uh, we're going to do a little uh, break. Logan has got uh, some info for you. You want to come on up? That's basically uh, what I wanted to talk about with this first talk, the basic program there and the little shift that we're doing with a few products. And when I talk later, it'll be about specific insect and disease control and some of the specific uh, products uh, more that we're uh, talking about. And we'll probably jump in with uh, some of these other people as, uh, as we go during uh, the day. Did we have a, our first? Oh, we're going to talk about crazy water. Come on up, Brian. Uh, Brian is here from the Crazy Water uh, Company. It comes in, what, four different uh, levels? Four, di four different levels, that's right. Yeah, we've got a one, two, three, and four, nice and simple. I like the four. It's the one in the red label, and it's the heavy-duty one. But you can uh, use it in, like I do when you make your coffee or teas or just drink it. It's kind of a, a, a natural health drink. If you haven't tried it yet, I recommend it. Yeah, so I, I, I do. Uh, I'm actually a holistic health consultant. I do uh, education for Crazy Water. 
and you know, I just talk about the, the benefits of, of healthy, healthy living. And one of the things I think we forget about is our body is composed of over 70% water. And you know, we talk about food and soil and all these wonderful things, but we forget about what, what the quality of our water is. And so crazy water is essentially, an, as, as uh, Howard said, it's, a, it's an unprocessed water. So it has all those natural minerals, all the uh, the trace minerals and electrolytes that, that we need to to function every day. So, yeah. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Do we have something to give away, Logan? I need to get my crazy water hat on. And y'all can get samples of the crazy water out in the lobby, and they have other products available. Um, so throughout today, we're going to give away some fun prizes, and actually the first winner gets um, a 12-pack of crazy water, six of number three, six of number four, and he is here today, um, Robert Nelson from Bedford, Texas. Robert? Robert? Oh, great! <laughs> You'll get, get your prize out in the back a little bit later, okay? Excellent, and um, be sure to try some water out when, when you leave the auditorium. Um, and another prize we have is the Texas Gardening, the Natural Way book. I'm sorry, Dad, I should know the name. Um, <laughs> and the, the winner of this fine prize is Glenda Hayes from Lake Kiowa, Texas. Glenda Hayes. Woo! All right. We'll meet you in the back. And the third prize for this break, um, I don't have it to hold, but it's the Plants for Texas uh, and the Gulf States. And the winner of that is actually watching us online. Um, and his name is Robert Battle from Houston, Texas. So um, we'll make sure he gets his book. And um, so be sure to stay with us throughout today. We'll be giving away some more prizes. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge a few other folks who have put this day together. Um, Kevin in the back with the technical support, thanks so much. Um, Tom from the library who we saw earlier. And Brian Bristow um, with Allen Parks and Recreation. So thank you guys for making this possible. And up next, oh man, I have so many jobs, <laughs> is Tyson Woods. He's going to be talking about um, more about the trees and the root flare that we saw. So here's Tyson. Thank you, Logan. And uh, again, thanks to all the people that have helped put this on. Alan has done a great job with this, uh, providing this wonderful facility and uh, the state-of-the-art technical uh, support here. So thanks to everybody again. I'm the one Tyson. with the laser that was in Oh, okay. That, no wonder I couldn't <laughs> find my laser. All right. It's all yours. 